This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com, and I have with me this morning Ty Andros. Ty is the president of TraderView, publisher of the Ted Bits website, and writer and editor of his well-recognized newsletter, also named Ted Bits. Good morning, Ty, and welcome back to Macroanalytics. Good morning, Gord. Ty, I want to discuss this morning your, your latest article entitled uh, Fingers of Instability. During our last session, I mentioned to our listeners that you were just about to release it, and I saw it this morning that John Rubino at dollarcollapse.com has rated it on his list of as best on the web, so I, ne- I need to congratulate you on that. Well, thank you, and I guess I'll have to send John a note. I wasn't aware of that. He's very good at finding the best articles on the web, so uh, and he's tough on them. So if he recommends it, it's worth a read. You covered a, a, a lot of subjects in the article that we've been focusing on with our guests at Macro Analytics, such as wealth creation, false growth, central planning, growing control of our government by others than, the, uh, than just the electorate. As is your custom, you make some very bold and insightful statements on these subjects, along with outstanding quotes from leaders whose wisdom has withstood the test of time. I thought we'd start out with how you differentiated in your article between wealth and growth. Because frankly, you really netted out here. I have a slide up that shows that. Could you talk to us about the difference between real wealth and growth? Growth is actually creating real wealth, and you can't have one without the other. But real wealth is uh, created by manufacturing it or growing it or mining it. And and it really is combined with uh, lots of sweat equity and risk-taking and personal sacrifices. Capital and sweat have to combine and to produce more than it consumes and create savings. And those savings are the seed corn of the future. And uh, that uh, that uh, disinflation and the you know wealth creation and that productivity is is critical for fractional reserve banking to work properly and for the fiat paper to hold some of its wealth. And um, you know that's why you can see countries that actually produce something and and actually are still uh, functioning in a semi-normal manner and and in this case I would just say Canada and and Australia with semi-normal interest rates but but they mine it they they grow it they export it they uh, provide more for less and they're rewarded for doing so by uh, having economies that uh, are not uh, as uh, vulnerable as uh, the group of economies that think they can print it out of thin air. And, you know, that's an epidemic in the world right now. And, um, you know, uh, it's uh, completely contrary to how their wealth was built. The idea that uh, uh, the United States was built by central planning and socialism is false. All the wealth was built by our fathers and grandfathers, and they came here and they started little businesses and went to work for others that did and uh, uh, went to work every day and worked long and they competed for business and they competed for business on price and, and, um, and uh, you know, uh, ubiquity and the rewards for having consumed their products. Uh, you know, there was no people that were that were, you know, guaranteed demand like an ethanol plant, but uh, more the, you know, sturdy competitors that uh, worked hard to uh, outproduce and, and outdeliver their competitors. And, you know, that's how the wealth of Europe and, and uh, the United States was built. But uh, those are memories today. Those are just things we can look in at in a history book. And, you know, there's uh, going to be no retreating from where we're at. And, uh, uh, you know, and Mother Nature is in the middle of creating a, a crisis. And Darwin, you can put Darwin in there too, uh, that is going to 
cause the people of uh, this part of the world to relearn those lessons the hard, the hard way. You say that growth in real terms is extinct in a developed uh, developed world, and a growth, if it's anything, is being represented by debt buildup. Do uh, you want to expand on that? You know, we we live in the land of George Orwell, and every, you know, black is white, and white is black, and socialism is called capitalism, and and um, you know, we have central planners that uh, try to you know take over societies. In fact, I would posit that. Uh, all of the, for the most part, the political establishment in the United States and Europe is little less than organized crime. And, um, you know, they call government growth and entitlement growth, uh, uh, growth. And of course, it's nothing of the sort. It's actually consumption of wealth. And it's consumption of wealth that's borrowed from future generations and transferred to, I'll call it the youthful, youthful idiots, uh, which the, public education systems have uh, brought forth. And um, these people are, you know, they are cheering on and supporting the people that are actually preying upon them. I have a chart up here now on central planning that you also talk about in your article in a couple of ways. And I'm going to, next one, after this, we're going to talk about the United States specifically. We've I've had a number of shows where we've talked about central planning, more with John Rubino and with uh, Charles Hugh Smith. And you and I haven't had a chance to really get into the subject, but your article brings it out on central planning and in talking about socialism. What are your views right now on the degree of which we're seeing central planning going on? It's the, it's the source of all the troubles we have today, completely. It's central planning from whether it be Brussels or or uh, the capitals of Germany or the capital of, of uh, uh, Italy or Spain or wherever. It's uh, These are centrally planned economies. They have legislated um, how things are done and who gets the business and who gets the, uh, you know, the goodies that is taken from the people who are being preyed upon. And, you know, don't think that the United States is uh, a free economy anymore. It's not. It's completely centrally planned. And, and of course, uh, what happened uh, in between 2008 and 2010 when we had the Tea Party was we had corrupt supermajorities in the United States Senate. And they put in place, uh, uh, I'll call it the bedrocks, the foundations of more and more central planning, more and more government control, and and then they just sell it to the higher highest bizzer, uh, bidder. And, of course, um, the people that were doing that are, are hardcore socialists, but they also learned their craft uh, in the most corrupt state and capital of the and uh, state and city of the in the nation and I'll call that Illinois it's the Chicago way and Obama came up through that uh, uh, system and he's taken it to, to a step that's uh, to a level that's inconceivable and of course he just actually moved it along farther it was already in place but uh, uh, they said, okay, we can do whatever we want, and they did. And those laws are nothing more than institutionalized corruption, political control that can be sold over and over again uh, to the highest bidder in backroom deals, uh, uh, you know, going forward. Because, you know, do you, ever, do you really ever see any kind of... Um, any kind of repeal of laws, and 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 let's just like use uh, uh, they call it the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. I was watching Lou Dobbs the other night on Fox, and as everybody will recall, uh, Nancy Pelosi said we have to pass the health care bill to see what's in it, and obviously it wasn't written by legislators; it was written by special interests, and then brought to the to the fore. But uh, he outlined uh, the different caveats that are wo woven throughout that bill uh, to force the unionization of the healthcare industry and 21 million employees. Well, who's that a payoff to? Would you say Obama's union supporters? But do you think that's going to contribute to more care available and, uh, and lower costs? Uh, no, that's uh, the antithesis of it. 
And um, it's just uh, one more example of Pandora's box, which uh, really were put in place. And now they're just, you know, there's just a new thing being discovered in them every day. Ty, the uh, slide I have up right now, you mentioned about the level of government expenditure now being uh, upwards of 24% of GDP. but And I underlined it here, but you said it does not include state and municipal spending, which would send it up to over 40%. How, how, how is that? How would that be the case that they that the G in, in the GDP would not be total government at all levels? Well, I'm sure that there's other ways that that uh, those capital expenditures get into the GDP reporting. Uh, although the specifics of it, I couldn't tell you. I will say this: the government G is counted at least double because that then it flows out as consumption and it's counted as the C, and then it goes out. Um, in multiple ways, which then comes out in the netting of the export Im- import, I, and I showed and discussed that. It's certainly, you know, it's been upwards. It, it, you know, for the government brings back some of the cutting we, with the fiscal cliff. We may get it back down into some manageable level, but you and I both know that it won't happen. Be, uh, it'll be ex- extended. But, I, but if that 40% number is valid, that, uh, that is just uh, but absolutely staggering. Ty, I've got a couple charts that I thought were just outstanding in, in your report. And it was contrasting the degree of money printing that's been going on, shown in, in the left, going back through 1980. And this is M2 specifically, because we don't publish M3 anymore. And then on the on the right side, velocity of money, which is um, showing us at levels that we have not seen before, at least going back through 1950. Comments? Yeah, I was going to comment that uh, that's fear. And that's fear of government, that's fear of the future, that's fear of taxes, it's fear of unfolding regulations, it's a fear of Obamacare, it's a fear of, of Dodd-Frank, it's, it's fear of a man in the White House who spends all of his time uh, demonizing uh, virtuous behavior, which is, you know, private enterprise, and tells you that uh, uh, somehow you achieved any kind of success, uh, um, based upon um, luck uh, rather than through hard work and smart work and, you know, risk. And uh, he tells you that if, if, you know, you are lucky enough to start a business and get it to success, that once you get to that level of success, he's planning on taking it away from you and giving it to somebody that's earned nothing. And uh, I'd like to read uh, a little, uh, uh, it's a, uh, description of where we live, and I got this from um, uh, Bob Hoy, but he didn't write it, but he got it from that. But here's three quotes, and one is ineptocracy, a system of government where the least capable to lead are elected by the least capable of producing, and where members of society least likely to sustain themselves or succeed are rewarded with the goods and services paid for by the confiscated earnings of a diminishing number of producers. And of course, we see that re- reflected in, uh, in that uh, velocity number. And then, of course, um, we all know about the Obama quote about you didn't build that. But, but you know, there's really something that goes uh, behind that. That means if you didn't build it, then the earnings from that is are not yours really. They're, they're the government and the responsibility and come from government. And then Obama says, uh, you know, this is one of his campaigns, which he just uh, said when he was in North Chicago, and a new vision of America in which prosperity is shared. Um, hmm. Doesn't bode well for the future. This is a hardcore socialist. Uh, that uh, now is getting away from the teleprompter enough that we really see what I'll call Freudian slips and uh, tell people what he really thinks. And um, it's not pretty. I think you've read this chart correctly, the one on the right on velocity. It's reflecting fear because with the amount of money that's being printed right now, velocity of money should minimally be rising to some degree, marginally rising, if not going up dramatically, to see it plummeting like this, and and I understood, understand that's a that crash. that's a crash. That nominal is down a little bit, so that would help. But that's a crash, exactly right. So that says people are not spending money 
um, in an accelerating way because they're worried of inflation, they're hoarding money. They're not spending it. They're not moving it. They're hunkering down. Small businesses and investing, etc. That is fear, lack of confidence, and that comes when there's indecision. And I think just, you know, mentioned it earlier, the fiscal cliff. The fiscal cliff is not about the fact that the government isn't going to extend these programs. It's about the fact that until they do it after the election, you've got instability, uh, indecision. And then if you admit that, yeah, I know they're going to approve it, then you've got what are the ramifications that they did approve it because it didn't get better. You didn't fix anything. You just extended the problem. So minimally, you've got 12 months in front of you of stagnant decision-making and, and poor public policy. And when you're in a situation like that and you've got to manage cash flow, what are you going to do? And that chart says that's what we've got here. And unless unless that turns around, we've got huge problems and printing more money is not fixing it. No, because it's just watering the soup. But, but, you know, I was just came back from Freedom Fest, which is a libertarian festival uh, in Las Vegas, which is fabulous. I recommend it to anybody. But but we, I was on a panel discussions, and I was on a panel discussion with Don Luskin. And Don Luskin's one of the favorites on Cudlow and Company, and he's definitely a Keynesian. And, and he asked the audience uh, how many of them support uh, the federal physical cliff. And virtually, you know, and he described it as a catastrophe. And I, but uh, literally all the hands in the, in the room went up, 2,000, 3,000 hands. And, you know, if not now, when? When is the government going to cut spending? Okay. I'm not in support of the taxes. I believe that we need flatter taxes and the tax code has got to be cut down to 15 pages from 9 million words. Um, the distortions and the social engineering and the corruption that's been written into the tax code has to be obliterated. And um, once we do that, then people can actually order their affairs to be productive. But right now, they're just ordering their affairs to steer their self away around every little piece of political corruption that's ever been written. And, um, you know, when when are we going to get our house in order, Gord? When? I mean, we can't do it today. We can't do it tomorrow. Um it, uh, I, I, you know, I, I guess I think that the physical cliff uh, uh, is a deliberate thing, and they put it in place so that um, it was on autopilot, and now they can. There's really no one to blame. One guy can blame the next guy. The right can blame the left, and the left can blame the right. But in the bottom line, is they just wanted more money. The when it'll be fixed is after we have a market clearing event and a crisis of of. Of proportions that will be larger than 2008. And, and, um, then I don't even know we'll fix it, but then we will be at least in an honest process of trying to fix it. Um, we will no longer be kicking the can down the road and, and extending and pretending and playing these games. We will, but I, I'm, I'm even wondering whether in fact we will be able to do it, do it at that point in time. There right now, the fiscal cliff is, is, is just an, is ridiculous. It's deliberate. It's deliberate. Uh, uh, the first thing, hey, probably. Well, it is. You're absolutely right. It is deliberate because what either party wins, the first order will be to extend it. So by extending it, we've fixed nothing. We've resolved right. nothing. What we've done is we've put ourselves into a no action till then, basically uh, December, January. Then the realization that everybody will happen, that we're doing nothing about it, and won't for another six months. And right now, people see that clearly. And, and I have up statistics right now that show that. They know that's going to happen. But until it does, they can't do anything about it. So this is what's killing us. Because if you've got a small business, you don't see the revenue growth. You're not hiring. You're, you're hunkering. You're hunkering down. And that's right across our society. Ty, we're... Ty, we're up against our, our hard line here. We're going to break and be right back. But before we do, just a last comments on, on, on this chart. Well, it just, uh, is a, I'll call it a specter of things to come and, uh, and what's unfolding. And it's going to continue to unfold. And like, uh, like I said, fear drove this. Oh, I didn't say it. Fear drove this crash and fear will, will turn velocity up. But the, the fear will be not from government, but from money printing. One of the outstanding presentations that you have available at TED Bits 
is a presentation called When Hope Turns to Fear. And that's what we have. We went from hope in the lack selection to basically being an election this year that's going to be based on fear, unknowing or knowingly. But that's at the root of it. I guess I'd like to say one last brief comment about the cliff. Uh, the cliff's going to be resolved. Uh, if the Republican wins, it will not be resolved because the Democrats want the money. Um, if the Democrats win, it may be resolved. But to think that it's going to be resolved during a lame duck session of Congress. Not a hope in hell. The lame duck Congress is now uh, a way for uh, people that are being turned out uh, to get one last lick into the system. And it, uh, you know, what happened in 2010, I, I believe, uh, which they passed a lot of major legislation, uh, and it was passed by people that no longer were really supported by, uh, their constituents. They were, had already been voted out. There's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of grandstanding. I will agree with that up until the votes are cast, but no action. You know, we just live in a, such a corrupt society and world. It just is, uh, it's uh, disheartening sometimes. Ty, we're going to break right now, but we're going to be right back because uh, we're going to, I want us to pick up on Italy, which you also focused on in this article as you move from Spain. So uh, right back here in a, in a few minutes. Thank you. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.